The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Burke and I am with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARP, and I will be your moderator today along with Andy Capehart, who is also with the APS TARP. We both want to welcome you to this webinar, Implicit Bias, What APS Professionals Need to Know, with our presenter, who I will introduce shortly. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARP, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and is administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' finders, findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. Now a little bit about the APS TARC, if you're not familiar. The mission of the APS TARC is to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing individualized technical assistance to APS programs. We're here to help in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. Please join us for Let's Talk APS, our monthly peer support discussion. We host two informal collaborative peer calls each month. Practice to discuss training, investigation, and care planning, which is the third Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and program management to discuss policy and program issues, which is the fourth Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard. Reach out to us using the contact info displayed at the end of the webinar to join. Next slide, please. Third, that the National Adult Protective Services Training Center, NATC, has launched and the no-cost APS core program e-learning courses are available for APS professionals to access. Please visit the website on the slide for additional information. These are really great courses. Next slide, please. Now on to some housekeeping. In the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find today's slides. You may download these at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter to log back in. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one, I apologize. <laughs> you may ask questions, share comments by typing them into the questions box at any time during the webinar. We'll relay as many as we can during the question and answer portion of the webinar, which will be at the end of this presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website along with a copy of the slides. We will notify all registrants via email when it is posted online to announce their availability more broadly through the APS TARC outreach channels. Everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours later with a link to download your certificate of attendance. CEUs are not offered for this webinar though, and be sure to take the brief eval survey when prompted. We would love to hear your feedback. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to launch a quick attendee poll so we can get a sense of who our audience is in the room today. And we're gonna launch that poll now. Our question is, what profession do you identify, identify most closely with? Single choice answer, adult protective services, medical, legal, other social services or other profession. So we'll leave that up here for a minute. I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll. All right, 80%, we have adult protective services. Okay, we have somebody from legal, 1%, other social services and other professions, nine and 10%. Thank you all for taking that. Next slide, please. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Shante Brooks. Shante Brooks, MSW, has been in the field of social work for over 11 years, serving older and dependent adults. In 2011, Shante began her career with the Riverside County Department of Public Social Services as a social worker for APS 
and in-home support services in the state of California. As a social worker, Shantae assisted the most vulnerable elderly and disabled adults through completing risk assessment, investigating abuse and or neglect, and providing interventions and or resources. In 2014, Shantae was promoted to a social service supervisor where she, response, where she managed, supported, and evaluated social workers in adult services. Shantae became a staff development officer in 2018. She is now responsible for developing curriculum, training, and instructing social workers, clerical staff, and community partners. Shantae is also a professional speaker and has presented to audience of, audiences across the nation. She also creates and provides state-specific training to APS professionals across the nation and to 54 out of 58 counties here in California. Shantae continuously dedicates herself to social work practice through training core social work values, ethics, and principles. So Shantae, thank you so much for being here today and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for your attendance here today at this webinar. I'd like to take a moment to also thank Jessica and Andy and APS TARC for this opportunity to present this information on implicit bias what APS professionals need to know. Before we begin with the presentation today on implicit bias, I wanna give you a little bit of background as to how I ended up in this role and this understanding and research of this topic of implicit bias. As Jessica stated, I have been in the field of adult protective services and in-home supportive services with the older adult and vulnerable population for over 12 years. Started off as a field social worker, promoted to supervisor, and then became a trainer. In 2020, after the death of George Floyd and the subsequent social unrest that occurred thereafter, Riverside County's directors and managers noticed that the social climate was impacting each of their employees. So they tasked me as a trainer to create and develop an implicit bias series for staff members. So we began this journey together. I did a lot of research on the topics of implicit bias, delivered it in a four-part series to Riverside County adult services staff members from social workers, managers, directors, office assistants over a course of two years. With this experience, I have learned a lot about this topic and want to present this information to all of you that are present here today. I know your role and your job as APS professionals or other professionals can be challenging. And I wanted to introduce this topic of implicit bias so that we all have a general understanding and knowledge about how, what implicit bias is and how it impacts all of us. So the purpose and goals of this training right, is intended to help professionals, no matter what your role may be, understand and minimize the role of implicit bias within your professional role. We have to acknowledge that we are all decision makers. The decisions that we make each and every day impacts the lives of others. So with this thought of implicit bias, the goal is to enhance fair and equitable services to elder and vulnerable adults. When, again, Riverside County tasked me with this project of delivering this training, it wasn't to acknowledge or identify an issue or concern among staff members. There were no problems to address, but rather it was an opportunity to bring about the conversations around implicit bias and the sensitivity of these topics so hopefully within the agency, amongst staff members, they are encouraged to have further discussions. A lot of the topics that were presented and will be presented today are often uncomfortable to discuss. So the goal was to enhance the great services that employees are doing and provide fair and equitable services, not only to the clients, but their family members, their caregivers, employees, peers, community partners, and more. So let me define fair. Fair, impartial and honest treatment of others that guarantees everyone has the opportunity to participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. 
We have to acknowledge the world that we live in. Society, our nation is not fair. Not everyone, not every group has the opportunity to participate, let alone prosper and reach their full potential. But hopefully with this insight with regards to implicit bias, the goal is to treat everyone fairly and give everyone a chance to participate and prosper. Next, we have equitable. Equitable is treating others that takes into account the individual group needs and our circumstances to ensure everyone can reach their full potential. Everyone can reach fairness. Equitable and equal may seem similar, but are slightly different. Equal is great in which you provide a service, you're giving, but equal does not take into account the individual group needs. In order to provide equitable services, you have to pay attention, you have to acknowledge the opportunities and challenges that some groups have faced. It's great to provide a service, but if you're not aware of equi equitable circumstances, you can provide a service and it can slip right through their hands because they don't have the support, the education, the knowledge to sustain those services. So the, again, the goal is for equitable services. And that means that we have to be willing to pay attention and acknowledge the world that we live in, the treatment of people in our world in order to provide services that are catered and unique to them so that they can reach their full potential. So let's define implicit bias. But before I define implicit bias, I first wanna begin with bias. What is bias? Let me first make this statement. You're biased, I'm biased, and everyone attending this webinar today is biased. We all have them. We all have them. A bias is when rather than being neutral, we have a preference or aversion towards a particular person, place, thing, or situation, which prevents our objectivity. So think of bias as just a preference, an aversion. They are shortcuts of our mind that help us navigate complex social and emotional situations. Our brains naturally created these shortcuts called biases so that we can quickly make assessments, jump to conclusions. We don't have time to process each and everything that we encounter. So we rely on our biases in order to move forward. So you have to acknowledge that within every decision that you have ever made, there was a bias, a part of that process. It's innate, it's ingrained. Biases, so just because I made the statement that we're all biased, let me make this next statement. Biases can be good or bad, positive or negative, appropriate or inappropriate, harmless or harmful. Again, biases are essential to our survival. We need to make those quick assessments, quick judgment calls. If you see, for example, a person wielding a weapon, you're not gonna pause and process the situation. You're gonna rely on your biases. A weapon is harmful. I need to run. I need to protect myself. Therefore, biases are essential to our survival. And again, they can be good, bad, positive, negative, appropriate, or inappropriate. So what are implicit biases? Implicit biases are our biases without our individual awareness or intentional control. They occur in our unconscious. Positive or negative mental attitudes towards a person, thing, situation, or group that a person holds at an unconscious level. Positive or negative attitudes, thoughts, opinions, ideas with regards to a person, thing, or situation. Our implicit biases often do not reflect or align with their explicit core values and beliefs. With your explicit core values, just like with myself, I believe that I don't judge people. I view people as equals, I wanna treat them fairly. 
but with explicit core values, if you're able to verbalize it, it's explicit. You're aware of it. But what happens in your unconscious? What are the thoughts, opinions that you have that you're not aware of? I'll give you a personal example. And I use this example all the time. But when I see a person with excessive tattoos, I automatically clench my purse in my purse because I feel uncomfortable, I feel unsafe. But again, explicitly, I don't judge. But my reaction to encountering a person just based on what I see, I rely on my implicit biases and I therefore react. You can think of implicit biases as a default setting, right? Or as my husband called it last night, cruise control. You go through life with various interactions with people, situations, and things in which you automatically have an opinion, thought, or idea. Those are your implicit biases. Implicit biases stem from a combination of factors that are unique to each individual. They're unique to you. And it's based on your experiences, direct or indirect experiences. Just with the example I just provided, when I encounter a person with excessive tattoos, I feel uncomfortable, I feel unsafe. Not that I had a direct experience or a negative experience with anyone with tattoos. It is because of indirect experiences, things that were exposed or told to me, what was portrayed in media. So again, implicit biases are a combination of your experiences, whether directly or indirectly, culture, how you were raised, what are your values, social groups, ancestral background, childhood upbringing, memories, past interactions, media, and more. So just a summary of implicit bias. Our implicit biases, again, those thoughts, assumptions, ideas, perceptions that we automatically experience happen within a tenth of a second as whenever you encounter a new situation, person, or thing, the implicit biases quickly come to your mind. Again, you may not be aware of them, and they happen automatically without your control in about a tenth of a second. Implicit biases are unintentional. You're not intentionally trying to hurt, harm, or judge another person. Let's hope that we're all here with good intentions, good hearts, minds, and souls. We don't want to judge others, especially in this line of work with Adult Protective Services. We're here to serve the community, no matter who is represented in our community. But we have to acknowledge that with implicit biases, even with your great intentions, your explicit core values, there may be an underlying assumption, stereotype, or thought whenever you encounter a new person, situation, or thing. And it is unintentional. Implicit biases are deeply ingrained. It is very challenging to identify the implicit bias. Think of implicit bias, bias as a thought that comes to your mind that you're not aware of and where it is stems from, how to identify it can be very challenging and it's deeply ingrained based on our experiences, based on what was told to us, what was taught to us. Group sorting. Group sorting is referring to in groups and out groups. In our society, we have to acknowledge that there are in groups and out groups. There's people in groups that receive more opportunities. Other groups of people receive less opportunities and face more challenges. There's hierarchies that we experience in our society. Implicit bias typically aligns with social hierarchies and that group sorting. Then we have learned stereotypes. As I have already mentioned, right? You may not want to believe in the stereotypes, but they were expressed and told to you multiple times. And therefore, at times you believe them. They occur 
when you face a, a situation or a person or a thing and you rely on those shortcuts, those stereotypes that were embedded within you. Shaped by our personal experiences, whether directly or indirectly, developed over a course of a lifetime. So yes, you may have been told or taught or viewed various situations or were portrayed various storylines about certain groups of people, situations or things, but your implicit biases do change and mature as you change and mature. They influence our behaviors. So think of implicit bias as the initial thought that comes to your mind that you're not aware of. That thought creates a feeling. Do you feel safe? Do you feel unsafe? Do you feel comfortable, uncomfortable? Do you feel fear? Based on how you feel, you're gonna behave or react. And those actions or behaviors can lead to various experiences, various interactions. So we have to be aware that these thoughts occur without our knowledge, but they do impact how we react and behave. In two-way dynamic, right? We all have our biases, as I explained earlier. You project bias, but you're also receiving bias. Even me, myself, I'm a minority, right? I'm a black woman and I have encountered and endured various biases towards me. But just because I may be a minority and have faced many challenges in my life, doesn't mean that I do not have my own implicit biases that I project towards others. Two-way dynamic. Oftentimes, especially if you have encountered or endured various situations or circumstances, it influences how you perceive the world, how you interact with the world, and how you therefore behave. I'll give you an example. I was promoted to become a supervisor in my early 20s, and I had to move from one office in region to another office, where in which no one knew me, um, my reputation did not perceive me, I was a brand new person to them. Two-way dynamics. I assumed that I would be negatively judged based on my age. So when I started my first day as a supervisor, I had my guard up. I was a little defensive. I interpreted everyone's statements, thoughts, and actions as negative because of the thought that they would misjudge me. They would treat me negatively. When in fact, they were very pleasant, everyone in my new office, very welcoming. And they had to prove to me that they weren't what I assumed them to be. Many of us have encountered that. We have to prove to others that I'm not what you think I am. Because we recognize that others have biases towards us and we're trying to counteract that with showing them who we are. So again, implicit bias summary, they're automatic, unintentional, deeply ingrained, group sorting, learned stereotypes, shaped by our experiences developed over a course of a lifetime, influences our behaviors, and the two-way dynamic. So there's various types of implicit bias. Where I'm just going to review a few. I'm just gonna review a few. So the first one is affinity bias. Affinity bias, in short, is gravitating to people or situations that are similar to you. For example, think of your work best friend oftentimes, or even your best friends outside of work. Oftentimes your in-group are people that are of the same skin color as you, share similar beliefs, have similar social economic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, 
you develop the affinity bias, you gravitate to people like you because there's trust. Again, as stated, biases are essential for survival. If you're willing to be vulnerable with people, including friends, you're gonna gravitate to people that you can trust. And oftentimes you trust people that are similar to you. Affinity bias. Even think of it with your APS clients. Right? When you encounter or meet a client that reminds you of your grandparents or of your parents, oftentimes because of that association, because of that warm feeling, you're willing to go above and beyond to take care of their needs. Affinity bias. The next example is ageism. So oftentimes with ageism, it is the discrimination towards people of older age. In our society, we view age as a negative. A person is automatically in decline. With ageism, Luckily, we work for this wonderful population of older adults, right? We get to experience the beauty of aging, but we have to recognize in the society that we live in, right? Age is often viewed as a negative process of life. In other societies, they view aging and older persons as uh, having wisdom and someone that is uh, influential in their society. But in our society, we view it negatively. Example, even with the statement, and it's meant, again, unintentionally to, un it does not intentionally harm anyone, but even with our statements, you look good for your age, right? That denotes that within our society that aging is a negative. Ageism also impacts younger adults as well because we often view younger adults as inexperienced, lacking knowledge, lacking awareness, and therefore cannot contribute to our society, help us make decisions that directly impact them. You see ageism in adult protective services. Again, when I was a younger adult out in the field, I would knock on a client's door. They would look at me and say, First, one of the first questions they would ask is, how old are you? How old are you? And with that question, it has implications. They're implying that I am inexperienced and I'm incapable of providing them help or services. So again, ageism not only affects older adults, young adults as well. Then we have gender bias. Gender bias refers to a preference for one gender over another. In our society, men are viewed as strong, masculine decision makers, intelligent, competent. Women are viewed as submissive, nurturing, caring, consoling. Gender bias can impact the job roles in which a person is assigned the task and duties in which we feel that a person is capable of, or misinterpreting a person's behaviors based on their gender. Example, an assertive woman within a workforce is viewed as bossy or rude, yet a man may display the same characteristics, being assertive and vocal, and they're viewed as a good leader. Gender bias, right, it impacts equal pay for various gender groups, and case assignments, and so forth. Then we have race and ethnicity bias. This is the stereotyping, discrimination, unequal treatment, negative attitudes for various racial and ethnic groups. There's a long history in our society in which certain racial and ethnic groups were treated unfairly. Yes, we have grown as a society in which we're trying to level the playing field, but we can't ignore the past because it still impacts us today. When you encounter a person of a various racial or ethnic group, you may feel discomfort, fear, or 
if they are part of the dominant group, you may automatically assume that they're in charge or someone to trust, race and ethnicity bias. Then we have the LGBTQ plus bias. This again is the stereotypes, discrimination towards anyone that is non-heterosexual. In our society, heterosexuality is viewed as superior and the correct way of living your life. And therefore anyone that is not heterosexual may be treated adversely. Happy Pride Month, by the way. Then we have the halo and horns effect. So the halo effect is the perception distortion in which you encounter or find out one positive attribute about a person or a situation and therefore you feel as if they're good people or you treat them favorably because of one positive attribute. We can equate this to certain professions. There are certain professions that we hold as a society on a pedestal. And therefore, if a person holds that profession, we think that they're all around good people, such as clergy members or priests, let's put in social workers, right? Doctors, politicians, right? Because they're holding that position, because we as a society put them on a pedestal, we have expectations of their actions and behaviors. But with the halo effect, it doesn't account for individuals that make mistakes, that we're all growing, that we're all learning. And we're really quick as a society to cancel someone. But in fact, we were the ones that set these expectations so high. Then we have the horns effect, which is the opposite. This is when you find out one negative attribute or characteristic about a person or situation and therefore think that they're all around a bad person. We experience this in our society, anyone that has a criminal record or drug use, substance abuse. Because we find out these characteristics of an individual, we automatically assume that there's no reform. There's no chance of, of thriving in our society. We relish them to a certain level of life and set low expectations on who they are and what they can be. And those are just a few types of implicit bias. There are many, many more. So we discussed implicit bias provided the definitions, the types. So now I'd like to review the impact. Some of the impact I've already embedded throughout the definition, but how does this impact us as APS professionals? Implicit biases affects our perception. Not only the perception of others, but ourselves. Based on who you are, your race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, culture, religion. There are expectations of how you should carry yourself, what you should do, right? So perception, not only of others, but ourselves as well. Implicit biases affects our attitudes, attitudes about others, behaviors, reactions, actions, our attention, our listening skills, and how we make decisions. Let me give you another example of how implicit bias impacts our behaviors with a light example. Let's say you meet someone new, it's your first time meeting them, and just based on how they are dressed and how they're carrying yourself, you may not be aware of the unconscious thought, the implicit bias, but in your mind, you're thinking, this poor person is boring. This person is boring. So therefore, you're gonna feel a little apprehensive of having conversation because it's going to be lackluster. And therefore, your reaction is going to be 
asking boring questions, not having appropriate body language, not fully engaging. The response that you'll receive from the, the person that you're encountering with is going to feed off of your actions, which then is going to reinforce that thought that, yep, they are boring. When actually it may be your actions and how you interacted with them that caused how that dynamic occurred. An inaccurate assumption about a person will impact how you feel and how you interact and react. And was that action and feeling appropriate and accurate to who that person is? So within Adult Protective Services, Implicit bias can affect how we engage with our clients, family members, caregivers, peers, and management. Think of affinity bias again, right? If you see characteristics that you can easily relate to, understand, you're more willing to engage, more willing to listen. But for a person that you may encounter or a situation, you might find, find out something about their history and you personally disagree, you're not gonna be as engaging. You're not gonna utilize your active listening skills to truly understand what the needs may be. Your interaction with clients, family members, caregivers, peers, or management. The time spent in interacting with others. The conversations that you have with others. And then interpretation. If we were not actively engaged, we did not spend a lot of time interacting, how are we accurately going to interpret their needs so that we can do the next steps of providing services? The service plans that are created for our elder vulnerable adults. If there is a thought that, for example, a person that is affluent has a lot of money, they have resources to get themselves out of situations. If that's the assumption that you make, right, it's going to affect your engagement, interaction, interpretation of their needs. And then when it comes to service plans, that service plan may be limited because of that automatic assumption that we created. Then we have job satisfaction and work performance. So this is with regards to peers, right? APS professionals working with each other, with their supervisor, with their management. If you feel that you are being represented, being heard, being listened to, you're going to be more engaged. You're going to perform great work. But if you feel isolated, you feel like a minority, you feel that when you do state something, no one is willing to hear you, right? You're going to be dissatisfied and therefore perform more poorly. So while implicit bias is unintentional, right? And it's not a result of malicious intent. Again, we're all assuming here today an assumption that we're good people. We're here to treat everyone fairly and equally, right? And we are not intending to hurt or harm anyone. So even though our implicit biases are unintentional, it can still lead us to judgments assumptions, stereotyping, distortions, prejudice, profiling, discrimination, and intolerance without even realizing it. As you see from the image here, oftentimes those stereotypes, again, that were taught, amplified throughout your childhood or early upbringing, create those implicit biases, those thoughts, those assumptions which then lead to a prejudgment, which will impact your behavior and your actions. And at times, based on your behaviors and actions, it can lead to discrimination. So again, we may not be able to control our biased thoughts. Again, they're in our unconscious or the stereotypes. But what do we have control over? Our actions paying more attention to our actions, behaviors, and reactions. 
pay attention to, for the example I provided earlier, someone with excessive tattoos automatically feeling uncomfortable and unsafe, and therefore I clench my purse and my pearls. I need to pay attention to that reaction and try to think backwards. Why did I perform and react in that manner? What judgment did I have? Then try to identify the unconscious bias thought and then identify the stereotypes as the why. So again, we may not be able to control the initial thought that may come to our minds, but we do have control over our behaviors. So we can begin to pay attention to how we feel, because based on your feeling, you're gonna react and behave. And then ask yourself, is this feeling, is this action or behavior appropriate, fair, accurate, or not? So implicit biases, again, can be good, bad, or indifferent but they can lead us to various actions and behaviors and reactions, such as microaggressions. A microaggression is a subtle behavior directed at a member of a marginalized group that has a derogatory or harmful effect. Microaggressions, again, very common verbal or behaviors that communicate a hostile or derogatory attitude towards stigmatized groups. Even within a compliment, it may be intended to highlight something positive within a person. But within that compliment, you may be degrading the group, such as you speak good English, meant as a compliment, thank you. But what are you saying about others that are of my either racial or ethnic or cultural background? that they do not speak good English. Next example we have is prejudice. So this is an unjustified and incorrect attitude towards an individual based solely on their membership of a social group. Unjustified or incorrect attitude. Let's be honest, stereotypes are not always inaccurate, but there are some right? Stereotypes, assumptions, generalizations, sometimes they may be pretty accurate, sometimes they may not, right? But an incorrect or unjustified attitude, assumption, stereotype, perception, is a prejudice. Then we have discrimination. The unequal treatment of an individual group on the basis of their statuses by limiting access to social resources. Unequal treatment, a group of people that may have to face more challenges, go uh, up uphill battle that they may have to face, right, and encounter, endure. Unequal treatment, behind discrimi discriminatory acts, it's typically a prejudicial thought. They're incapable of doing X, Y, Z. So therefore, I'm not gonna give them the opportunity to participate in X, Y, Z. Discrimination. Then we have disparity. Disparity is the inequitable treatment or services provided in non-dominant groups compared to those provided to similarly situated people from dominant groups. In short, one group fares worse than others when all things are being equal. Disparity. Then we have disproportionality. This is the over underrepresentation of people based on their membership in certain groups as compared to their representation in the general population. So disproportionality is the over underrepresentation of people in groups. So I'll share some information with regards to Riverside County. Okay. Again, we are here to provide a great service to the community. We're here to serve everyone in our community. But yet, throughout this process, we identified an area in which we need to grow, in which we had stats that were disparate and disproportionate. So in Riverside County, the demographics in total, right? 
47% of our population is Hispanic, 35 is 35% is white. Okay. Total demographics and then others. I'm just highlighting these two groups today. So again, in Riverside County, 47% are Hispanic, 35% are white. Abuse can happen to anyone is our thought, right? Abuse can happen in no matter what race, cultural background, social economic status, abuse can happen to anyone. So the thought would be our APS population should reflect the demographics of the county, right? Our percentages of our APS clients and their demographics should reflect the county that we serve. But we found that our APS clients, 9% were Hispanic as compared to 47% of the general population, 9% Hispanic. I'll throw in other, other was 10.5% and white population at 59% as compared to 35% of the population. So yes, we can surmise, right? The Hispanic population may identify with other or white, but it's still not gonna reach that threshold of 47%. So there's an under representation of Hispanic clients in APS. With our white population, 59% APS, 35% of the population, representing an over representation of the specific population. There's many reasons as to why that's the case. In certain groups in the Hispanic population, right, there, there's culture, family dynamics, lack of a maybe lack of awareness that adult protective services exist, fear of government and government agencies. Yet on with regards to the white population, right? White population may be more willing to call social services and programs for assistance, more awareness of that adult protective services exist, right? More interaction with mandated reporters and so forth. This information was insightful for us. Because yes, we all had the intentions and the thought that we are doing pretty well serving our community. But maybe there are some areas in which we need to improve. Maybe we need to go into specific neighborhoods and highlight what we do, inform people that Adult Protective Services is available to support and protect them, provide more education, provide more insight. It, it just lead, led to a lot of insightful conversations and actions. Because again, as an agency, we're doing well, we're serving the community, but the stats showed us something different. So let data inform your decisions. Right? Look at the numbers and it may give you some insight into how you are doing. So we discussed implicit bias, the definitions thereof, the different types, right, and the impact. So now let's discuss some strategies. Strategies to address implicit bias. We have to remember that implicit biases are malleable. They can change, they can be updated, and steps can be taken to limit their influence on our behaviors. You have to think of the concept bringing the unconscious to conscious. Implicit bias is like having a habit that can be reduced through a combination of awareness. First, we have to want to be aware, right? We want to know how we're doing what we're doing, right? And again, not to state that we're doing anything wrong, but is there an, are there areas in which we can improve? Right? So awareness is key. Concern about the effects of implicit bias. How is it affecting you, your peers, your agency, and then your external customers, the vulnerable older adults? 
application of strategies to reduce inappropriate, unfair, incorrect implicit biases. Again, our minds are flooded and have to make thousands of decisions a day. The implicit biases and the biases aren't going anywhere. They're innate, they're deeply ingrained. So they're not gonna go anywhere. But what are some strategies that can address the biases that are negative, inappropriate or unfair? Because again, not all biases are bad. There's good, bad, positive, negative, appropriate, inappropriate. But hopefully we feel motivated to pay attention to the implicit biases that are incorrect, inappropriate, or unfair. And what are some strategies in order to identify the unconscious? How do you identify the unconscious? There's a statement here from Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So what are some strategies to bring it from the unconscious to the conscious? First, you see the strategy spell implicit. So our first one is introspection. Explore and identify your own biases through test. There are tests out there. Harvard University Implicit Association test is available. Okay. With that test, you may or may not agree with the premise or the results, but it's insightful. I enjoy providing the test during trainings because it just brings about the dialogue around these topics, right? And forces you to look inward, whether you agree or not, right? So introspection, you can take test or through other means of self-analysis, right? Awareness, bringing about awareness, emotional intelligence. Then we have mindfulness. Practice ways to reduce stress and increase mindfulness, so, such as focused breathing. Mindfulness is a practice that is very helpful and I advocate often. It teaches you how to focus on one thing at a time. Being mindful, reducing your stress. Oftentimes we're in high stress, high anxiety situations. You're gonna revert to your default settings. You're gonna go on cruise control, those implicit biases. But with mindfulness, it allows you to pause, slow down, pay attention so that you can make accurate and appropriate decisions. Then we have perspective taking. Considering experiences from the point of view of the person or situation being judged. Putting yourself in another person's shoes. Would you like the way that you just treated that person? Put yourself in their shoes. Or if there's a group of people or situation that you're unfamiliar with and you haven't encountered those experiences before, put yourself in that person's shoes. How would it feel, for example, to be a minority and receive these adverse treatments? Put yourself in that person's shoes, perspective taking. Then we have learn to slow down. Recognize situations you're more prone to bias, then pause and reflect to reduce your reflexive actions. What situations or types of people or groups of people are you more prone to a negative bias? Think about it. Take that pause and reflect on how you may want to respond in the future. Individuation. Evaluate people in situations based on their unique circumstances and characteristics rather than those affiliated with their group. It's very easy to generalize. I even made some generalized statements today, right? But we have to recognize that each individual is unique. But oftentimes we don't allow ourselves the opportunity to engage or interact with the person because we're turned off automatically based on their assignment or affiliation with the group. But we have to individualize each person. Identify what is unique to them. 
Then we have check your messaging. Create a supportive dialogue, acknowledge, clarify, and explore rather than judge, stereotype, or assume. Yes, you may have in vast knowledge and experiences. You may be woke and very aware of all the disparities and inequities in our society. But we always have to make sure that we're coming from a place in which we want to continue to acknowledge, clarify, and explore. We're all individuals in which we can all grow and enhance and update how we interact and view not only ourselves, but one another. Then we have institutionalized fairness. Support a culture of diversity and inclusion. Taking it back to the affinity bias, your in-group. Diversify. Allow yourself the opportunity to engage with people that are different from you. Allow yourself that opportunity to learn about others. Once you learn, and when it's appropriate, share your awareness with others. Share your experience with others. Then we have take two. Resisting implicit bias is lifelong work. As stated, implicit biases exist. They can be changed, they can be updated, but they're always going to exist. So you have to constantly restart the process and look for new ways to improve. Continue this process and this journey of growth. Take two. So this is Breaking the Habit Worksheet, another tangible activity that you can do, right, to identify some of your biases and strategies on how to negate some of the negative inappropriate biases, okay? So you can address these questions. I have a bias against who or what. I assume these three things about that person or situation. I am concerned about this bias because why? I think that the individual to whom I have a bias against would feel, sorry, so to speak, feel. Some positive examples of individuals of the group I have a bias against. And here are ways I can increase opportunities for contact with groups I have a bias against. I'll give you a personal example. As an APS worker, I'm still working through this one. But there is this innate thought that I have with regards to the unhoused homeless population. And the thought that I have and I carry with me, still working on it, is that homelessness is a choice. People want to be homeless because they have the freedom to do whatever activities they want to do. An assumption, a stereotype. So therefore, as the APS social worker receiving a case for a homeless or unhoused person, I was quickly the one as, that went to my supervisor and asked to swap cases. I don't wanna handle this. I don't wanna handle this. But if I was forced to engage and encounter and perform you know, my APS duties with this client, I was judgmental. I made a lot of assumptions. The service plans were minimal because I had the assumption that they're not gonna comply. So why try? Right? So I did this breaking the habit worksheet for myself. So I have a bias against unhoused or unstably housed or homeless individuals. I assume these three things, right? That they have this lifestyle because it's a choice. They are all engaging in inappropriate activities right? And they're reluctant to services and change. Those are things I assume. I'm a concern about this bias because I'm not allowing them an opportunity for fairness, giving them an ability and an opportunity to reach their full potential. I'm being unfair, right? I think that the individuals to whom I have a bias against would feel misjudged, not heard, uh, not connected with their APS professional myself, right? 
some of the po some positive examples of individuals of the group I have a bias against. I took the time to look up additional cases. We even have our own homeless unit in Riverside County to hear some of the success cases. And identifying that each person that is unhoused or in a situation, there's often a story. But that is something I completely ignored before. They're individuals that need assistance just like everyone else. And I allow myself the opportunity to hear those stories, read reports, in order to get a different perspective. So here are ways I can increase opportunities for contact. Again, asserting myself, allowing myself to be placed in a situation in which I have to encounter and assist someone that is unhoused or homeless. So again, this breaking the habit worksheet was helpful for me to identify one area in which I have implicit biases and how it impacted the services that I'm providing to a specific population. So again, I encourage you all to also do this worksheet because it may provide you with some, some insight about yourself. So this is with regards to implicit bias strategies, right? The previous strategies were more so about how you yourself can prevent, minimize, your negative biases, assumptions, stereotypes, prejudice towards others. But again, as stated earlier, implicit bias is a two-way dynamic. You project bias, but you also receive bias. And being on the receiving end of an incorrect, inappropriate assumption does not feel good, is very unpleasant, and here are some techniques on how to address negative biases that you may have received, whether it's from a client, a family member, a peer, supervisor, manager, right? When you receive these incorrect assumptions, stereotypes, generalizations, in which you feel you have to prove yourself, make sure you address those situations as well to prevent burnout, becoming desensitized, and so forth. The problem isn't just that people experience bias, is that their experiences are often undiscussable. How often are we having conversations with their peers, with their supervisors, with one another about the ill treatment that you received? Again, I, I recognize that as APS prof professionals, your caseloads are heavy, you have to keep going, but take a few moments to address these situations when they occur. You can't ignore them, shove them down, not pay attention to it because it will fester and it will come up in other behaviors or negative habits and so forth. So let's be willing to discuss, right, with one another or various other techniques that are listed here. So first we have focus on your strengths. Focusing on your core values, beliefs, and strengths can motivate people to succeed and may even buffer the negative effects of bias. Remind yourself of who you are, what your purpose is, right? Focus on your strengths. Next, we have don't dwell. When you experience discrimination, it can be really hard to just shake it off. In a calmer moment, it might be helpful to talk over the ways you can cope with similar experiences in the future, come up with a plan for how you might respond or what you could do differently next time. Once you've determined how to respond, try to leave the incident behind you. Don't dwell. Don't dwell isn't referring to just let it go. Acknowledge the situation, acknowledge that negative statement, that prejudicial or discriminatory action towards you, acknowledge it, but process. Put a name to it, acknowledge it, but process. How are you feeling? And what are some techniques that you can utilize if it occurs again in the future? 
don't dwell. Then once you have processed, let it go. Then we have delicate dance. This is not surprising, but marginalized people struggle with calling out bias when they're on the receiving end of it. The delicate dance between making a point and doing it in a way that doesn't offend or put the other person on the defensive is extremely difficult to execute. But there are times when the opportunity cost of not confronting bias is too great. Delicate dance. When you are on the receiving end of a negative or inappropriate bias, it can be very challenging to bring up to other people what their blind spots are or how they have impacted you. And it may be easier just to ignore it or keep going or laugh it off. But there are times in which the opportunity cost of not confronting a bias is too great. You may not be able to take this approach with every person or every client. But there are times in which you need to address another person's thoughts or biases towards you. Okay. And just keep this quote in mind, what you permit, you promote. What you permit, you promote. And again, you may not be able to take this approach with every client, right? But again, there are opportunities, there are times in which you may need to. Then we have seek support systems. One problem with discrimination is that people internalize others' negative beliefs about them. You internalize it, even when they're false. You may start to believe you're not good enough, but family, friends, peers can remind you of your worth and help you reframe from those faulty thoughts. Get support from your peers, from a professional, right? Because the weight of receiving ill treatment, negative biases, inappropriate assumptions, it can weigh very heavy. You need support. We're not in this alone. Allow others to assist you, right? So that's when you can go to your peers. They're in the same line of work, so they really understand what you're going through. Go to your family, your friends, or even seek out a professional for, the, for that assistance and that support. So those are just a few strategies and techniques on how you yourself can address when you those times and situations, those incidents in which you have received a negative bias. In this line of work as APS professionals, we're there to serve. But we have to be honest, not everybody's willing to receive the service from us. And they may inaccurately judge you, call you out of your name, be inappropriate with you when your purpose is to help. So again, it, it is very important to address those incidents, how you feel, process them, and then leave the incident behind you so you can move forward and help the next person. That will conclude the implicit bias presentation today. I want to take a moment just to thank you all for your dedication in this line of work in serving and helping the older adult and vulnerable populations. I appreciate this opportunity to present this information to all of you. It has been a true honor to speak and address all of you today. And I wanna thank you for taking the time out to be present. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jessica. Right, thank you so much, Shante. I really appreciate you really talking through this training about normalizing biases and really the fact that you shared your uh, personal, you know, stories and uh, allowed that vulnerability, I, I thought was really, really helpful. So we're going to go ahead and open up to questions. Going to wait for a few minutes to see if there is uh, any questions. You're getting lots of thank yous, Shantae, in the in the oh. questions box. <laughs> Can I make one statement, please? Of course. Again, with this topic of implicit bias, is not to 
again, point out that we're doing anything wrong. It's just to bring about discussion and awareness. And hopefully you all feel encouraged today that you can continue on with the discussions even outside of this webinar, right? Um, again, it's a very difficult and challenging topic to discuss, but I encourage you all to continue with the dialogue so we can all learn and grow together. Thank you. Thank you, Shantae. I'm just checking the boxes a little bit more. Let's see here. It doesn't look like we have any questions. So on behalf of APS TARP, uh, Shantae, I want to thank you, our speaker today, for being here and present. And I just want to remind everybody to stay connected with us at APS TARP. All right. Uh, here is information on how to stay connected with us uh, on this slide right here. So again, thank you all for investing in your professional development and keeping the older adult population free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. All right, thank you.